In 1874, the first Lord Aberconwy invented a product which turned soap from a brown colour to a lovely crisp white. And the proceeds of that invention enabled him to buy all this. Welcome to a spotless Antiques Roadshow from Bodnant Garden in North Wales. <laughs> The Aberconwy family took their name from a word that means Mouth of the Conwy, which looks across the Snowdon Range into North Wales. The little fishing village of Conwy is home to some well-preserved treasures, some of which you may already know about. This outstanding 13th century castle built for Edward I, and this early suspension bridge built by Thomas Telford in 1826. What you may not know is that Conwy is home to the mussel men and they have an ancient occupation, they're pearl fishers. As well as being delicious to eat, Conwy mussels yield small, soft pearls. It was one of the most important pearl fisheries in the country and stretches back to Roman times. Between 12 and 14 men keep the tradition alive. The mussel men probe the depths with long-handled rakes that were originally invented by medieval monks. Dragging up a quarter of a ton of shells is considered a back-breakingly good haul. A short way up the river at Bodnant, the Aberconwy family dined on many a Conwy mussel. After buying the property, the first Lord Aberconwy's daughter, Laura, transformed the gardens here. She turned the garden into something very special. Just take a stroll down the laburnum walk when it's in bloom. She passed the talent on to her son, Henry. His speciality was rhododendrons and magnolias, which abound here. He created the garden's most stunning features, a series of Italianate terraces leading down to the lily pond. And he dismantled an old mill in Gloucester and had it brought to a new home here at the end of the canal terrace. In 1949, the Aberconwy family persuaded the National Trust to take on the gardens, but kept the family home. And this is the superb setting for today's roadshow from Bodnant Garden. Over to our experts, who are as busy as bees. The Victorians were masters of invention, especially when it came to the production of animals and how they adapted them for, for various uses. But how did this owl come into your possession? Uh, my father bought it from my mother. I think it came from Scotland about 65 years ago. Heavens. And uh, she treasured it so much so that it was never allowed out of the house for valuation. And uh, when she died, of course, uh, my sister and I couldn't part with it, but we didn't know, we don't know what it is. She said it was an inkwell. Did she? Yes. Well, she wasn't quite as wise an old owl oh. as, uh, as uh, this one. But let's have a look at it. The lid opens up. And with a nice smooth interior like that, I don't think for one no. minute uh, that it was an inkwell. No. It was actually a mustard pot. Was it? And when no. it was originally made, a little spoon would have hung out of the oh. uh, underside of the beak here. Right with a little mouse on it, and the mouse would have been the handle oh, to the spoon. Really? Now, we've got to try and find some hallmarks, yeah. and I think the only place we're likely to find them is on the base here, so I've got to unscrew this, hopefully, without damaging it. Now, we've got a complete full set of hallmarks yes, right yes. under there, yeah. and that's rather comforting because it was made by a firm of very, very innovative silversmiths called Charles and George Fox. And the Fox brothers specialised 
in things like these yeah. owls. It actually yeah. would have just stood oh, would it? like yes. that without this yes. on it at all. Yeah. Owls are terribly popular. Yes. There are certain animals like frogs, mm. pigs, owls, mm. are always popular. Mm. And mustard pots made by the Fox brothers in the year 1848, mm -hmm. which this one is hallmarked for, yeah. Yeah. are really quite valuable. And I think something like that's probably worth about three thousand pounds. Gosh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm amazed. So maybe I was a bit too hasty about saying your mother was not such a wise old owl, <laughs> or wise old bird, I should say. But uh... well, he is a really entertaining fellow, isn't he? Yes, he's rather charming, I think. Yeah. Who is he? He's the gardener at Attleborough Hall. Um, near Nuneaton. Right. The hall is now demolished. It's dated up here, isn't it? Uh, 1879. Yes, yes. Uh, so, some while ago. Relatives of yours involved uh, here? It was actually painted by the sister of my great grandmother. Right. Patty Townsend. And that's her signature up there? I think so. Yes. I haven't got my glasses on, so no, I can't tell. Says, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a man that obviously the artist knew quite well. I would think so. Because I, I think the think character's so. all there. Isn't oh, yes, it? I think he's wonderful. Yes. I just love the broken veins on his cheeks. Yes. Uh, so he's obviously yes. an outdoors man, you know, yes. very much. And obviously, he has no teeth. Exactly. I was <laughs> going to say that because your, your lips draw right in, mm, don't they? Mm, yeah. And I love the way he's got a sort of um, casual attitude towards personal hygiene, yes, that's shall right. we say, <laughs> when it comes to shaving and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, uh, it, I, you know, it's quite interesting because the rest of his attire is quite loosely done. She's just, just gone for colour, hasn't yes, she? she? She has. Just, yes. Just mm. a general impression mm. of how mm. he looked, but the face yes. that's got all of his character. Yes. And the glittering yes. eyes, a piercing. Blue slate, eyes, yes. Grey, blue yeah. eyes. Yes. Yeah. Now, I am mystified by this hat. It's perfectly extraordinary. It's got a broken brim, I can see that. But what's the red thing? The red handkerchief uh, in which he kept his lunch. <laughs> so, he wore his lunch under his hat. Was that to stop other people pinching it? Oh, possibly. Um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Perhaps a way of keeping it cool. Absolutely hilarious. Yes. Now, it's been through the wars a bit, I couldn't help but notice. There's yes. some missing paint and some yes. distressed varnish there. What's yes. happened there? Well, I'm not quite sure, but uh, recently, it, uh, some mix-up through a pickup. It got left under a bush in a garden. But <laughs> it got uh, left it's under been. A bush. <laughs> well, yes, yeah, she left it for me to pick up, but uh, and I did not find it. But how long um, was he under a hedge for? Days, hours? No, uh, days, I think. Weeks? Maybe. <laughs> don't know. <laughs> um, oh dear. So he's been dragged through a hedge backwards to get. But virtually, him. yes. Uh, well, doesn't right. he look it? Well, I'm afraid he does, rather, <laughs> in every way. But he is great, mm. and uh, I've got to value him, of course. Yes. Well, yes. he's such a character. Mm. Uh, it's got to be worth a thousand to fifteen hundred. That's very nice. Yes. That's very nice. Insure it for two thousand. Right. And we'll make a point of doing so. Good. <laughs> well, some people say that when gemstones shine and, and, and fidget around like that, that they shuntle. And this is a shuntling little flower head. Tell me about it. Where did it come from? Well, about, I think it was 1977. I am. Um, Pestered my father to dig me a pond in the garden. Yes, and when he was digging out, he got about a foot down, and I noticed this sparkly bit in the rubble that he'd dug out. My goodness. And I <laughs> took it in and washed it and showed it to my mum. <laughs> he wasn't very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think? I thought it'd come out of Christmas cracker. <laughs> <laughs> Not buried treasure then? Uh, mm. Well, no, I didn't want the garden dug up, you see. No. So I didn't want her to tell anybody. <laughs> so probably the necklace and, and the bracelets and all the rest is still, <laughs> is still lying there. No, no, it's a beautiful little thing isn't it well it is it, it's got all the color and sort of shine from something from a Christmas cracker but it's anything but actually yeah. um, it's actually made of real stones there's a beautiful little blue Ceylon sapphire and a yellow sapphire and I think that might be a, a zircon there mm -hmm. and a piece of hematite which is a strange um, uh, iron rich uh, stone with a sort of funny sheen on it mm -hmm. and then possibly an almondine garnet and diamonds all the way around and rose diamonds and a brilliant <laughs> diamond in the middle wow. so buried treasure indeed isn't it <laughs> and we can only imagine the sort of um, upset of the owner when they lost it and and the joy of when you found it mm. but I think it's great it just does need a little bit of work I'm terrified of losing this garnet here because yes. it's right out of the setting mm -hmm. no problem to have that 
that done at all, no problem either, to convert it back into a pendant and have it, have it tied up and wear it so that everybody can, can have the fun. There goes the garnet in my hand. Right. Let's hope it doesn't fall in the grass. <laughs> and Freddie, how old it is? About 1900. Gosh. And I think it's probably of, um, of, of, of Eastern manufacture. And very right. often this sort of very vibrant um, colour scheme is it suggested it may have been made in Ceylon and certainly a, a Ceylonese sapphire here. <laughs> but anyway, well, finding something in the garden, I think if it was measured as sort of six, seven hundred pounds would be about right. Wow. Oh, gosh. But... Christmas cracker. <laughs> I want more of your Christmas crackers. Well, I'd like to join in the Christmas ones if they're like that. No, but I think it's a Gosh. fantastic story. I'm really thrilled with it. I want you to wear it. Maybe both of you should wear it. Will you both wear it? I do it. Can you share it a bit? <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks. Do you collect Japanese objects? I do, yes. Why do you like Japanese things? Um, the intricacy of the articles, the how they were made. Yeah. It's unbeatable, isn't it? Unbeatable. When yeah. you see the top stuff, it is. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely defies belief. Yeah. Yes. This uh, one you've bought? Yes. Recently? Uh, fairly recently, yes. Where did you get it from? I bought it off the internet. Did you? Yes. I know you did. How did you know? I was the underbidder. You weren't? I was. I can't believe that. It's true. You're it's joking. absolutely true. You're joking. I mean, what a chance. That's that you should turn up here and we were bidding on the internet on the same object. Well, I can't believe that. <laughs> well, it's a fantastic quality box. Made of boxwood. Yes. Boxwood is extremely slow growing and therefore has a very dense grain to it. And that's a, a, a socking great chunk of, of box. Yes. It's signed here, Shu Osai. Right. Not known to me. And in carved and engraved overall with monkeys playing amongst peach trees. And of course, this is the old Chinese legend of the um, of the monkey, the, the sage equal of heaven, who steals the peach of immortality. Right. And that's what this is all about. And they've inlaid stained ivory for leaves and various other stones and hard stones uh, for the peaches, including moonstone. Right, I wondered what that was. Now, I've never seen mm. a Japanese bit of Shibuyama style with a moonstone. Oh. And I have to tell you, I've looked at this very carefully, and I'm of the opinion that this was pretty much new when you bought it. Right. Not old. Not old. It is the best piece of modern carving of its kind I've ever seen. Yes. It was in the order of £300, was it? Originally. And at that kind of price, it's worth it. Yes but it is not old. Right. I don't think it was a mistake. Well, it was a mistake if you thought it was old, but it's not no, a mistake I in the sense... I have my doubts, but the yeah. quality yeah. It didn't matter in any way, yeah. really. 50 years from now, I don't think anybody's going to care. No, And that would be true. worth quite a lot of money. And I'll have enjoyed it that length of time, and anyway. Um... What about this little number? Yes, well, I bought that off a dealer about 10 years ago. I presumed it was a piece of banco, but I hadn't seen a piece like that before. Well, good on you. I mean, that's exactly what it is. Yes. yes. Um, it's not marked at all. No, it's not. No. Normally, you would expect to find a mark yeah. in here somewhere, but um, they didn't mark everything. The Mostly, they made teapots, of course. Yeah. But that, I've seen then. I've got one of those. Yes. Um, if you look here, you can see a join. Right, faintly underneath there. Yep. Yes. So, and, the, and the stripes don't work. No, they, they stop. don't come together, no. So what they've done, they've taken a... They've got a mould of this, they cut a, a lump of the clay, and they have press-moulded the inside. Now, if you yes. broke that head off, yes. you would find thumbprints in there, right. and that's made the body. Yes. And they have done that extraordinarily well. I mean, yeah. they, they've spent a it's lot of time... It's quite thin, if you look through the mouth, you can it, see... It doesn't weigh anything. No, no. He's uh, not showing any signs of wear, and he's 120 years old. I love him. I, I really, really love him. 
Um, having said all that, I don't think it's worth an enormously valuable no. thing. Perhaps two fifty, three fifty. Yes. Well, I paid eight pounds for it. Well, well done you. I think you've got a very good eye. Well, I hope that sometime in the future I'll meet you again on the internet. Well, I will try to avoid you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. This looks like a well-worn book. Looks like it's seen some life. You can almost feel the impression of generations of hands who clutched this, this book. It's lovely. I can see Nicholas Culpepper, an English physician back in the 17th century who wrote a famous herbal. But the rest of it, well, it's in Welsh. Yes. Uh, it is, in fact, a translation of uh, Culpepper's original and um, in the Welsh language and translated into North Walian uh, Welsh. I'd love to hear you read that in Welsh, if you don't mind. Yes. Llawlyfr ydy hwn o llysiau a gasglwyd gan Culpepper yn ei ddydd ac wedi gobeithu yn llwyr gan David Thomas Jones y llan llofni dros a ddim dyddiad ar y cyfri hwn. Lovely. So this is Culpepper's Herbal? Yes. And it's a book of instruction. It tells us how to use Tot herbs. Totally, yes. How to use them for medicine, I'm assuming. Yes, it does. With pictures yes. to help you identify yes, them. Yes, indeed. Have you ever been tempted to use it? We have used uh, some of the uh, recommended uh, herbs, yes. In your family? In my family, yes. Uh, an uncle of mine broke every bone in his lower body in an accident uh, in a pit outside uh, Wrexham. And my father and I made a poultice of comfrey leaves. And after a period of about eight months, uh, we found that my uncle not only survived, but he walked again. That's an amazing story. I really like this kind of thing. It's very rare to find Welsh books surviving in decent condition. Um, it's not particularly early. I would imagine this was printed in the 19th century. It's not a 17th century original. I would imagine this was printed in Carnarvon sometime in the early to mid 19th century. And I don't imagine there are many copies still surviving. As to value, I think it must be worth somewhere between two and three hundred pounds mm -hmm. in this condition. Lovely. Thank you very much. Now, on the road show, I'm very lucky because I often talk about posters, and so I know why that's there, but it's very, very rare that I get a chance to talk about paintings. You know, I'm not really a painting expert, but here, clearly, is a very pretty painting of some rural scene. Now, what's the link between these things? Well, my father-in-law, my late father-in-law, was head of publicity for the post office savings bank. Right. And um, he had this brilliant idea. In the middle of dinner at home, he said, wherever you go, there's a post office savings bank. And we could have a, a series of pretty villages with little post offices in. And this is what he did. So this was his scheme? It was his scheme. So essentially, he, what, he went out and picked painters, commissioned works, yes. which were then converted That's into posters. Right. And he used to love going out, um, driving through the countryside, trying to find pretty villages oh, well, with a, yeah, yeah. a nice post. So he chose a spot? Very often, And yes. then found the artist? That's right. How did he pick the painters? He visited galleries, exhibitions, and um, if, so, he, if he liked a painter, he would commission him. And how many did he do? We think there were 30 in the series. 30 in the series. And this is number 15. So there's, there's something to do with the post office in each one. Absolutely. So um, if we look at Clavelli on the poster, yes, you've got there is the post office on That's that right. famous hill down through the town. Yeah. So this is an artist called Kenneth Webb. Now, yeah. I have to say, I don't know much about him. Well, I found out a little bit about him. He was born in 1927 in, in, in London, trained in England, and he became head of the Ulster Ah, so he was working in Ireland. And he lived in Ireland. So he's an mm. Irish, Irish painter yes. with an Irish seat. Yes. Because clearly this one is Claude Munkester, yep. very well-known painter. Very well-known. So the list must have been a mixture of yes. the great and the good and the not-so-good. I also found a letter signed by the Postmaster General, who at that time... Was Ernest Marples. Yes. Well, there's a famous name. I mean, we think of him now more as a, a, for, for, right. as a transport yeah. minister. But, yeah. of course, he was Minister of Posts in 1958. Yeah. Now. I like it because, as a story, because if we go back to the 1930s, we've got the railway companies, we've got Shell commissioning posters from a whole stable of wonderful modern artists. And he, in a way, has continued it into the... Because we're talking 1950s, aren't we? Yeah. He retired in 59. Right. And how did he get this one? 
Oh, it was presented to him on his retirement. He was asked what he would like, and he said, I'd like number 15 of the series. Because it was Irish? Yes. It's not a great name, but it's a very pretty picture. And, of course, Irish paintings are popular. I think we're going to look at something like a thousand, fifteen hundred pounds for the painting. So it's a legacy of a kind. Yeah. But in a sense, it's, it's about the story. the story. And I love it. Thank you very much. My pleasure. A lovely little glass with um, incredible iridescence on it. It shines in the sunshine here, doesn't it? Absolutely beautiful. Yeah. So it's a super little piece. How do you come by it? It was 1967. As I just started collecting bits of glass, and I knew that some friends of mine were selling some antiquities. So I sent my former wife along to the showroom to buy it, and I said, I really like that piece. You could really go wild. And so when she came back, she said, here it is, I got it. I said, how much did you pay? Two pounds, ten shillings, she said, I had to go to. Oh, we took it Yes. <laughs> and, and, and while, t while she was went and bought it and, and was swinging it quietly on her little finger, a chap came up and he said, oh, you've got that, that jug, he said. I came up especially from London and I was out at the loo when, <laughs> when it came up and I'll give you four pounds for it. And my, my wife said, no, I couldn't possibly sell it to you. My husband told me absolutely I was to get this piece. Anyway, it's not much of a profit, four pounds. He said, I did say 40. And she nearly <laughs> dropped it. <laughs> so that's it, and I've had it ever since. Uh, so you didn't sell it? <laughs> no, no I, good heavens. No, she well, I'm didn't. glad you did. Yes. Oh, God, yes. 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 It would upset everybody, I yes. think. But it's a lovely little pot. And of course, it's Roman, uh, about 2,000 years old. So it's no price at all for something 2,000 years old. Well, I do feel it? that. Roman glass is incredibly finely made. This is mold blown, blown into a mold. Right. Incredible that that. 2,000 years ago, they were able to do little pieces like this, and as light as a feather, but has to be terribly careful because there are fakes of these things right. made from old bottle glass, um, and they're very thick and heavy, and, and nothing at all like the beauty of this one. These are found in graves, of course, and probably for containing oil or unguents or something like that, and this gorgeous handle with trailed glass to put on like that. What is its value now? I suppose um, at one time, Roman antiquities were very little value, but glass now is beginning to move really? quite sharply. Oh, and I suppose a bottle like that from £2.50 is now going to be perhaps £150. Well, that's quite reasonable. <laughs> Over 40 years. Over 40 years. <laughs> it's a good, good margin upwards. <laughs> but even more is the joy of Absolutely. having such a super little piece. Absolutely. Do look after it. Thank you very much. Now, I've seen some pretty weird and wonderful things in the last few months on the roadshow, but I think this probably tops the lot. <laughs> the oldest toilet roll that's ever been seen on the roadshow. I actually found it in a derelict farmhouse, so... I mean, one I of our, I didn't know I One of our experts has looked at it and has placed it around 1910 to 1918, which makes us think it's one of the oldest toilet it's rolls. It's got to be a smack, yeah. And look at all these things on it. Let's see yeah, what we got. Yeah. Bear in mind, Isal disinfectant. Isal disinfectant is in daily use in British hospitals throughout the empire. Guard against infection. <laughs> well, I suppose it says you're taking a book into the loo, doesn't it? It does. Doesn't it gives you something yeah, to read. It does. Have you ever been tempted to try a bit? Never, actually, never. It's a bit shiny and slippery, isn't it? Yeah. What made you bring it along to the roadshow? I didn't imagine that anybody would be able to put a price on it. So. So you thought this might it be the was, only thing brought yes, to Rocha that I we did. couldn't actually value? Yes, I did, yeah. Do you know, I think you might be right. <laughs> well, I'm pleased about that. <laughs> well, you've brought along today a piece of ironwork, which is not something I normally see in Militaria. So tell me, what's the story behind it? It's one of the handles, the pattern that was made for the coffin of the unknown warrior in Westminster Abbey. Now, the, the, the Tomb of the Unknown Warrior was tremendously important because, of course, there were tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of soldiers who were uh, killed during the First World War whose remains w w didn't allow their bodies to be identified. Of course. And so it was terribly important for the families of those soldiers to be able to have something in order to pay their respects. 
and the ceremony took place, I think, exactly two years? Two years after the armistice. To the know, day? To the day, November the 1920, at the 11th hour, yes. on the 11th day. Um, and uh, an oak coffin, I believe, made from the British hat. oak. From Hampton Court, and it was a gift from the British Guild of Undertakers to the people of Great Britain. And, and this is an example of one of those handles, obviously not the so one of the original. Another eight. Right. What an astonishing thing! And what, what, what's the relevance to you? It's the company uh, Brunswick Ironworks in Carnarvon, uh, founded by my grandfather, and in 1920, 20. they received a telegram we, to go down to London at once. These had already been made, but they were found to be inferior. So he was asked to make one of these, came home, did one, took it back to London, and then he was then commissioned to do the eight handles and the straps on the coffin. Yeah. Is, is this the telegram that summoned yes. 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 your grandfather, yes. was this, yes. to, to London, um, in connection with iron fittings for coffin of unknown warrior matter most urgent and this is from the office office of works now look this is dated 1st of november 1920 yes. Yes. now that's just 10 days yes. 10 days yes. before the ceremony yes yes well and that's he, astonishing well he worked apparently once he'd received the commission for two days and nights with no sleep right right now you've also brought along some photographs yes and this photograph here shows very clearly the handles. And what about the plaque? Because I see you've also brought along a plaque, so how can this plaque be there? Ah, uh, well, they had two plaques. And what happened was that they weren't sure whether it was going to be for king and country or king and empire. So by 1920, they thought it should be for king and country. Because a lot of the countries in the empire were already considering independence, yes. weren't they, yes. of course? You know, normally on the roadshow, of course, at this point, we talk about value. Mm -hmm. To be very honest, I really would rather not in this case, because I, I think something like this is beyond value. And I think it's just very important nationally, but also, of course, for Carnarvon as well. But what have you decided to do with them? Well, we were going to send them down to the Imperial War Museum, but we put off sending them because we heard the roadshow was coming and we really? thought you might like to see them. So they're actually going down to the Imperial War Museum on Monday. Well, I have to say, I am truly, truly privileged uh, to see these, and I think anybody watching will be privileged too. And I thank you so much for bringing them along and giving us the opportunity of having a look at them. Thank, thank you. you very much. I was sitting at my table this morning, and out the corner of my eye, I saw one of my colleagues with these in her hands, and I practically leapt up and ran after her because who wouldn't? I mean, they're vases you want to chase. Yeah. They're both magnificent. Where have they come from? Well, they were in my grandfather's house. I mean, I remember them as a young, young lad. You've well, known them all your life. I've known them all my well, life. Well, they're, yeah. they're both wonderful in their own way. This one here, um, I mean, I think you, you know the names of the, the factories. This is yes. uh, Pilkington, Royal Lancastrian on the bottom. I don't think you've noticed here, there's a little monogram here of a shield with an R in it. That's actually for an artist called Richard Joyce, oh, who right. specialised in this type of decoration. He also did a lot of heraldic decoration. Right. And Pilkington are an interesting factory who specialised in this beautiful lustre ware, yeah. which is high fire. You see how the different colours are, yes. the, and the shading. This is all done with the, the type of glazing, the type of firing in the kiln, and the use of the lustre ware. And they did it magnificently. Yeah. There's a few little problems with this one. There's a little bit of, of chipping here, which does kind of affect it, but it's still a splendid thing. Well, when I, when I got the vase, um, after my, my grandfather passed away, the lid was actually stuck on ah, well, with I think some that, sort of glue. That is what's happened. At yeah. some point, yes, you're, there, there we can see That's here. That's right. At some point, um, the, the, the glue was actually lifted yes. the glaze off, which is yes. a shame. Yes, and I mean, is. Th th this is just an illustration. Look how just inside yeah. they've finished that. that. That's the kind of care you get with a firm like Pilkington's. Yes. And the same thing can be said about this. And I, I've got to say, I, I love this vase. It, it, it's, yeah. I mean, who couldn't love it? We've got a moose looking over a balcony. Yes. There's curtains, uh, sort of Arabian sort of lamps. Here we have a giraffe yeah. and some sort of strange bird. Yeah. And I think, yeah, there's like a little sphinx. I mean, it, it, it's mad, um, it is, but yeah. wonderful at the same time. Yeah. And here's the mark on the bottom, it's Wedgwood. Yeah. Um, now, I can tell you, do you know who, you don't know who the artist is? No, I just, I thought it just looked like the, the, the fairy 
bowls, you know, the Wedgwood well, Fairy Bowls. you're on the right track because the Wedgwood Fairy Iron Lesser was designed by somebody called Daisy McCabe Jones, and this is who designed your piece. Oh, right. The difference is, I've seen it, my colleagues have seen it, and none of us have ever seen the design before. No. Um, I haven't had a chance to check whether it's an unrecorded design. The other thing which has made me hesitate slightly is um, her Fairyland luster pieces always had a pattern number on the bottom with a Z prefix. This doesn't. Right. So either it's, it's a rare sample or an unrecorded piece. Yes. But it's, it's very rare and really quite exciting. They're both from the 1920s, but look how differently the style of them. This is much more looking back to the arts and crafts style of the previous century. This one is very much up to date. You know, only in the 20s would you have a giraffe and a moose looking over a balcony. And I suppose, you know, that leaves us to the price. Yes. Um, this one, because of its slight damage, yeah. it's going to be worth six, eight hundred pounds. Is it? This one, a collector would bite your arm off. And I think, really, how do you price something so rare? You've got to be looking at, I think, somewhere between six and eight thousand pounds. Golly, you do, you do surprise me. Maybe even a little bit more, because yeah. it's a sort of thing, yeah. in the right sale, mm. with the right collector, it, it could fly. Not all dresses are Welsh. But we're standing here with a beautiful backdrop of the Talifan Hills here. So tell me why you think this is Welsh. Family has been locally to this area a few generations ago. So I naturally assumed uh, that it's from the area. So you can trace it back through several generations, can you? Yes, uh, last 200 years, reasonably. Well, that's not bad, anyway. Uh, no, reasonably. Well, it's clearly an 18th century dresser. Where, have you moved around in Wales, or where's this come from? In his first years, probably hadn't moved far because it was a horse and cart's job, uh, really, moving in those days, wasn't it? Ab absolutely. So is this its first car journey? Or I'm talking about both of them. Are they both? Is their first car journey to come to the road show? It's the first journey on the Batayas, yes. <laughs> That's lovely. Honestly. It's really nice that either by horse or cart or by van, you, we bought both pieces along. We've got this really nice 18th century oak press here. No nails, all pinned together, pegged together, yeah. in totally original state. It's lovely to see them together. Wonderful. But I really want to concentrate on this dresser. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. I think it is a local, or Denbyshire, possibly Flintshire. It's yeah. that sort of north-east Welsh area. Yes. So not far from where we are now, probably. Yes. Um, now, why is it Welsh? OK, apart from your family history, which is absolutely paramount to the way we record these things, the type of oaks used. Firstly, look at the front here. This lovely light nut brown colour is called peduncular oak, which was grown in the Welsh lowlands. Also oh. came from North Europe, so you have oh, to be careful. Yes. Difficult to tell the difference, but this is typical of lowland oak. Nice, straight grain, brown, easy to work. Yeah. That's peduncular. This oak at the back is a bit of a mess, isn't it? Well, yes. <laughs> this is called sessile oak which grows in the hills. It's much harder, much more brittle, and the colour is much darker. So immediately you know this is Welsh Highland, and here we've got Welsh Lowland. What's this cheaper? Cheaper? Yes. And really, really difficult to cut. You can see marks, we've got frame saw marks. And they're better shown on the back. There are some lovely frame saw marks where a man has put this into a vice and had to cut these boards by hand with a, with a partner, not in a pit, but in a, in a vice, oh, yeah. cutting that by hand. And you can see those arduous marks and all these knots. It's a real difficult stuff to cut, and which is why it's so split and so lo looks so crude. Yeah. And the first reaction, you think it's just old floorboards, but they're not. This is probably original to it from the late 18th century. And I think this has clearly been made by a carpenter. Um, if we look at the drawer, yep, just a nail drawer, rose-headed, old-fashioned nails. So that's a carpenter, not a cabinet maker's made that. So a local farmer who was handy probably made it. 220 or 30 years ago. And I've just noticed something on the side. There are two little stamps on the side here, yeah. uh, OT. Could that be the maker? It could be the maker, yes. but I suspect it's more likely the owner at some stage who would mark everything. Literally, the Welsh dresser, possibly the press here, yeah. and, uh, the horse's <laughs> harness, everything would be marked with his uh, uh, initials on it. I've got to value it at some stage, haven't I? Well, hopefully. Well, what's it? I mean, these have gone up and down a little bit. Yeah. Um, but I think this is such a charmer, minimum of £5,000. 
and I think in a shop probably even a bit more. What a lovely thing. But you're not going to sell it, are you? No. We'd have nothing to pass on then, would we? You hesitated for a minute there, didn't you? Oh, no. no. You're going to keep it? Yes. All right. We get an awful lot of boxes, all different mm. types, all different materials brought along to the roadshow, but seldom one as nice and as pretty as this. Can you tell me anything about its history? You know, about 20 years ago, uh, an aunt of mine died, and um, I was clearing the house out, and, and that appeared, and I put it in a plastic bag and brought it home. But uh, I do believe that she had been a lady's maid. Right. And that she travelled widely between London yes. and... Uh, New York, right. and possibly a uh, further afield with the with this particular family she was working with. Okay. Yeah. Well, this type of box with this lovely enamel on it is very typical of those made in Vienna, mm -hmm. and this one dates from about 1920. Mm, that's right. But it is absolutely super condition. But what makes it even more desirable is the fact that it's got a Middle Eastern mm -hmm. scene on it, and that's quite rare. Yeah. Um, the most important thing about enamel is if it's damaged, the value drops dramatically because mm -hmm. it's very difficult to restore, and especially something of this quality. But this is absolutely perfect. If we open it up, the question then is, what was it used for? Quite. Probably a snuff box of mm -hmm. this size. You could use it for pills. And it has one tiny little mark here, which is just stamped 935. Mm -hmm. That's the standard of the silver. Sterling standard is 925. Mm. So this is above sterling standard. So it's a high quality silver. Very, very pretty. Um, any idea what it might be worth? No, nothing. Well, I think because of the subject matter mm. uh, and the condition, I think six to 800 pounds. Mm -hmm. Good. It's not bad for finding no, something no, in, no. Not bad at all. <laughs> in your no, aunt's no. house. Thank you very much. temporarily halted the queue to arms and military to bring our expert Graham Lay to the camera. Graham, your turn this week. If, heaven forfend, your house should go up in flames and you had to grab two objects from the house, two of your most precious objects, assume, of course, you'd saved the wife and pets. <laughs> and you've got a lot of pets, I understand. I have, I have, yes. I mean, excluding the ones indoors, which are cats and dogs and parrots and you, you name it, we've got lots of outdoor animals too. We've got horses and miniature Shetland ponies and chickens and guinea pigs and, well, you name it, we've got masses of them. <laughs> so you wouldn't have any time to grab two watches, but let's assume that you did. <laughs> now, you've brought along a couple today. Talk, talk to me about this one first, Graham. Well, um, this is just a simple piece of paper. Um, um, it was uh, written in wonderful copybook script, probably by some poor little schoolboy who had obviously uh, done something rather naughty at school or not been terribly industrious, I guess. And his name was Thomas Lay. And he wrote this in 1795, uh, so over 200 years ago. Now, we know it's a relative of mine, but we don't know who, because I can't trace it back further than my grandfather. So you haven't been able to find anything out about little Thomas Lay, who wrote, Honour is purchased and maintained by industry. Well, you know, he was obviously not a very good speller either, because if you look at the top line, honour virtuous men, the second line, honour vituous oh, men. Oh, beautiful <laughs> writing, though. <laughs> but poor little boy. I think the problem is, you know, that I spend my time telling people day after day after day, make a record of your family members, make a record of your family history, because as the generations go down and as we leave things to future generations, so the knowledge gets diluted until eventually it disappears altogether. Well, you're all nodding here in the background, aren't you, there? Yeah. Because you tell everyone here at the Roadshow as well, don't you? So how frustrating for you, then? You've got this... It's beautiful, isn't it? It's only a scrap of paper, but it's lovely, and yet you know nothing about him at all. Oh, well, it's incredibly frustrating. Who knows, one day I might have time, when I'm not doing a Roadshow, to, uh, to look into it. And you say that the personal histories and keeping a record of those personal histories is so important. And when people come along to the Roadshow and they bring along items, I've noticed you get, you know, really emotional emotionally involved in those stories. I mean, what have been, you know, some of the most moving for you, would you say? Well, certainly um, this year there was a letter to a Quaker who was a conscientious objector during the First World War. And it was a little letter 
uh, and it said something like, if you are too much of a coward to fight, wear this. And there was a white feather pinned to the letter. Why would one keep that? And why was it sent? It's an incredible thing. And again, brought a lump to my throat, that. Talk to me about the books, because talking of lumps to your throat, I know, I know there's a little poem in here that brings a lump to your throat as well. Well, I adore books. I, I collect books. In fact, the problem is I can't walk past a second-hand bookshop. And I remember my mother reading from the Winnie the Pooh books to me uh, very often in bed. Um, and, gosh, it brings back so many memories, because when I was seven, uh, my school used to put me uh, into speaking competitions in front of thousands of people in uh, town halls, that sort of thing. It must have been quite daunting. It was terribly daunting for that sort of age. And one of them, I had to stand up and I had to recite, and I can remember it uh, to this very day, but it's only a short one. Let's hear it, then. <laughs> <laughs> OK, it goes. It's called Happiness. It's about this little boy in the pouring rain, which might have been appropriate for today. And it goes... John had great big waterproof boots on. John had a great big waterproof hat. John had a great big waterproof Macintosh. And that, said John, is that. Oh, I think a round of applause for that. <laughs> Now, be honest with me. This is rather unloved, I think. When did you last have it working? Never. It never has worked. Never in your lifetime? No, no, it hasn't. So, what's it doing at home in this sorry state, then? <laughs> Where did it come from? My late husband and myself bought it from the Vinyl Estate when they were selling up. This was in the very early 50s. And, uh, obviously, it has never been restored, but I would like your advice on whether to get it restored or what. OK. Well, that's going to be quite easy to handle for you. At the moment, we are, not theoretically, but we are definitely either in or going into recession. And when we're in a recession, anything of fine quality retains its value fairly well, and things lower down the scale are actually very hard to sell. And in today's market, even in pretty good condition, this is going to be a tricky seller. Uh -huh. The clock is um, basically Shinazari decorated, not sent to the Far East, but done in the UK, and it's dating from about 1770. Uh -huh. Now, Charles Snuggs, interesting maker, do you, know, do you know of him at all or not? No, never heard of him, actually. Nor have I. <laughs> and I've taken the trouble to look him up and can't find him either, but Farnham, as you probably know, is a, a nice market town in, yes, in Surrey. Yes, absolutely. Um, and it is an absolutely typical eight-day movement with strike silent from the 1770s. Yes, Absolutely uh -huh. typical. To clean and overhaul the movement is straightforward and would cost you, because it needs resilvering and the dial needs yes. a little bit of work as well, yeah. you could get that well done for sort of £850. I see, yes. Plus the dreaded yes. VAT, of course. Of course. But the case is a different matter. Yes. Now, first of all, do you find it appealing or not? I do. Yes, I do. OK. It's well, different. the joy of it at the moment is this panel, and this is directly on oak, this panel is actually still quite vibrant. Uh -huh. But once we get round the sides of the clock, you can see there's a fair amount of damage. Yes. And up to the hood, all the moulding needs redecorating. Uh, and yes. And particularly the hood. Yes, Where of it's course. come away from, from the pillar up here. That's right. To do the case properly. Yes. It's going to cost you probably 1500 to 2000 pounds. So you'd need to spend around 3000 pounds yes. and in the current market you wouldn't see that back. Uh-huh. So right. the answer is put it away, yes. not necessarily for another 50 years, <laughs> but certainly till the end of this recession and review it again in 2 or 3 years time. Yes, certainly will do. Lovely. Yes. These embroideries, it's really exciting to see them. Tell me where you got them from. I got them from a lady in Gloucester who dealt in old embroidery pictures. And I got them because I was deputed by my brother and sister to buy a golden wedding anniversary present for our parents. And what attracted you to them? I collect embroidery pictures. <laughs> So, of course, for me, that was, you know, absolutely wonderful, yes. 
and this bucolic scene. Absolutely. And yes. of course, what's so fascinating about them is that you have this, you know, supposed shepherd and shepherdess, but of course, these would have been for a very grand house. Yes. And it's very interesting. The rich um, love to have these romantic notions of what people in the countryside yes, did. Yes, the shepherdess. The yes, shepherdess. Yes. And of course, if you think about it, in the 18th century, the porcelain factories were producing lots of, of shepherds and shepherdesses. And even people like Marie Antoinette Absolutely. had her own little farm yes. where she had powdered yes. sheep. So I, I they, didn't <laughs> know she powdered the yes. sheep. <laughs> and she would play shepherdess for the day. And this is very much the same thing. And what's very interesting is that is the little butterfly yes, here, which is lovely. just and there's another one there. There look, too. Yes, yes. Absolutely charming. Yes. And of course, what is lovely about them is they're very early too. They're lovely. There's a lot about them that you would think possibly late 17th century, but of course the clothing you would put them into the 18th century. So probably something like 1720 or 1740. So they are quite early, they're, yes. They're very yes, early, yes. beautiful mm. tent stitch, silk on linen, beautifully done and so finely done. Those stitches are so tiny. And very often they were actually doing it, you know, by firelight, candlelight, yeah, yes. which was incredibly bad on the eyes. Mm. I mean, this is so fine, so minute, the stitch, which of course is another sign of quality. They're just quite, quite charming. When did you buy them? 1967. And do you remember what you paid for them in 1967? I think it was 150. 150 pounds? Yes. It was a lot, a lot. believe you me, it was a lot of money, even between three of us. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Yes. I mean, obviously the colours have faded slightly, yes. which you would expect for something yes. that, that was done in the early 18th century, but they're still quite strong. I, I, I love them. I think if, if you were looking to, to buy a present for somebody today, you would certainly pay in excess of five thousand pounds. <laughs> I uh, always thought I wouldn't do the <laughs> shop thing, but I really am. Goodness. They are just so lovely as soon as I saw them. So Thank you very much. <laughs> I am amazed. I really am. No, I did not think. Yeah. Well, I certainly think you had a very good eye in 1967. Thank you. <laughs> I wasn't born when these pictures were painted. These, this is 1950s pub London, isn't it? And, and actually, you can almost smell the beer. You can almost feel your fingers getting stuck to that sort of drab, sticky counter. No offence, madam, to your cleaning skills. Um, they're by Leslie Cole, signed down there. Leslie Cole, do you know much about him? Not a lot. Um, he was born in Swindon, I think, yep. 1910, yes. and was a, a war artist or part of the... In the, in the Second World yeah. War. And a very celebrated one, too. Mm. The Imperial mm. War Museum has mm. got a lot of his work. Um, they're terrific, aren't they? Yes, I think they're fantastic. Mm. We've, we've had them for probably 30 years or more now. And we sit and look at them during our mealtime and often discuss the subject matter and the various uh, characters that we see in the pictures. Can we um, try that? I mean, <laughs> she's great, isn't she? Mm. She's, do, how old is she? She's, what, uh, in her early 30s, would yes, you say? Yes, yes. Mm. She's quite pretty. I yes, think. yes. Doesn't look happy, though. One thing that I, I do notice, none of them seem to be smoking. I noticed that, too. And, uh, and I would imagine that in 1950s London, the, the air would have been thick with tobacco smoke, normally. Mm -hmm. And um, what, what do you think? He's whispering something to the other Well, he's talk, talking to in, mm. into his beer. Mm. I thought that might be a woman. Really? Well, you Possibly, see, there's, yes, a, there's a sort yeah. of splash of red, mm. which might be a brooch or something, sure. and the hat. Uh, uh, but most of all, don't you just love the way these glasses are painted? Just a single oh, yeah. smear that of white. The white here. And, and there's no outline at all, and yet that glass that. is perfectly yeah. described. Yeah. And the other interesting thing is this, this piece of screen that they've got down the, the counter here. Oh, yes. Um, pubs of this era, there was this segregation between the various people, and this would be... Oh, between um, the saloon be, bar and the this public be, bar. Yes, so that must be the, the public bar. This side will be an extra penny on your pint, and this is where the... The posh side. The posh side. That's very um, interesting, because, you know, these paintings come out of the Euston Road tradition, really, and the Euston Road School was very interested in honest uh, subjects of everyday life, and actually there were quite a lot of socialists in it, and they were much more concerned with the working man than they were with the... Um, well, with the posher side of things in the saloon bar. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very appropriate that it should be the public bar. Uh, it's in a great tradition of, of paintings of cafes or bars. I mean, it's very much like Manet's painting mm -hmm. of the uh, 
bar at the Folie mm. Bergère. Yes. I mean, if I was a painter, I wouldn't mind, you know, mm. this would be my second mm. favourite subject. I, th I think this is, this is it's <laughs> like a photograph. It's, it's, it's almost like a moment in time. Yes. And you wonder what they're saying and what happens mm. next. Because actually you can see what happens next in the second mm. picture down here. Yeah, that's true. Um, because here we are, we've moved round the bar mm. a bit, haven't we? Yes, yes. Or perhaps we've even slipped uh, further down the bar. Yes. <laughs> we might be a few right. pints of mild into the <laughs> into evening the here, evening. I think. <laughs> Uh, and, and actually, I wonder, do you think that's the same chap as we saw mm. in we, this? Yes, we discussed this. Yeah. Yes, definitely. yes. Because now he's buttonholing this guy mm. and saying, you know, the problem with yes. the youth of today or something like that. And I like to think that that's actually his beer, the artist's beer. It's got that's a handle. It's yeah. different yes, from the yeah. straight. Yes, yes, yes. But what wonderful paintings. I think they must have been very unpopular once. I think so. Mm. And, and mm. this is why we brought them down, because we thought the subject matter is so... Um, it's unusual. I mean, did you did you buy them? Um, they were bought at a market in Liverpool, which was during the 1960s. I think for old money, <laughs> seven shillings and sixpence. <laughs> and what do you think they're worth now? I mean, um, I, I haven't a clue, to be quite honest. Well, put it this way: you, you could drink an awful lot of pints of beer with the value of these pictures now. I really think um, people are after this kind of gritty realism now. I'd be amazed if they they went for less for than uh, than. Six thousand pounds each. Really? Yeah. That's amazing. Really <laughs> amazed if they <laughs> went for less. That's uh, that's quite something. There are no prizes for guessing when your uh, your tea set was uh, made because it sort of shouts, dare I say, Art Deco. But I believe that it has what you might call a bit of history. That's right. My father was demobbed from the RAF in India in 1946. Um, he then worked as a pilot for the Maharaja of Gwalia. And when it was my husband's and I's 25th wedding anniversary, he gave it to us as a present. What a nice thing to be given as a present. Back in the 1920s, 1930s, you found that uh, some of the finest Art Deco uh, furniture and furnishings found their way uh, into the homes of uh, uh, relatively young Maharajas who wanted to show that they were in tune with the Western world. Um, and something like this is, uh, is going to have obvious appeal because it's got style, and, but there's a novelty element as well. Let's have a look at the uh, teapot. First of all, um, what a great shape, isn't it? Yeah, beautiful. I mean, it's designed for, for anything to pour out there effortlessly. Um, I love that sun ray. Look at this finial. Look at that. But the material. Um, and look at it extend to the, the handle. It's almost like an, an early plastic. It's an early sort of, almost a form of lucite um, with that lovely emerald green. But it's practical because it's... It doesn't insu get hot. It's an insulator. Exactly. You turn it upside down and you've got the, these, well, some stamp marks which go on about patent and all that sort of thing. And then you've also got this Indian script mark which had been engraved into the, into the base. I had a quick word with uh, uh, Alistair Dickinson, our silver man, and uh, um, he came to the conclusion that these marks were probably put on in India, that this was probably actually made around about 1925, 1930. Um, they're, they're not even silver, they're silver plate. Really? But to be frank with you, I don't think it makes that much difference in a situation like this. When it comes to the value, well, it's, it's all in the name. And uh, the name in this case is the Maharaja of... Gwalia. Gwalia. Uh, because if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for anybody, isn't I it? I would imagine uh, so. <laughs> so consequently, um, although it is only silver plate, I I've got no uh, problems in saying that if this should appear on the open market, I'm not going to be able to buy it for less than £1,000, without well. <laughs> question. Ever since I first started to learn about sculpture and animal sculpture, I literally fell in love with the American Western image. Uh, perhaps it's from watching too many cowboy films as a child, I don't know, but it just, uh, just speaks to you, doesn't it? Indeed, yes, it's very emotive. Tell me about it. Well, it came to us about uh, 10 years ago on the uh, death of my wife's father, Richard Griffiths, who was a fairly eccentric local bank manager. Uh, one of Richard's hobbies was um, marrying, marrying fairly wealthy heiresses, and uh, <laughs> that's really all we know about it. So that might have been somebody who was travelling, certainly, as you say, had some money and therefore mm. go back and forth to America, where, of course, this was cast, as I'm sure you know. Uh, uh, 
Have you done much research on the skull Not himself? really at all. I know he was working in the latter half of the 19th century and early 20th century. Um, yeah, well, let's um, try and fill in the, the gaps, if I may. Um, here you've got his name, C.E. Dallin, or Dallin, uh, and dated 1913. Well, he was born in 1861 and had a long life. He died in 1944. But his main work, as you say, was the early 20th century. Born in, in Boston, Massachusetts, trained in Paris, like most sculptors, all good painters and sculptors from America would go to Paris in that wonderful epoch of the Belle Epoque in the turn of the last century. And he um, became internationally known, but very well known in America. It's, um, it's a very interesting cast. The problem is there are an awful lot of copies of these around. Mm. Um, so we have to try and establish whether this is a real one or not. Um, let's try and put you out of your misery. Uh, what I like about it, I go down here, um, it's got the, the foundry mark, which is a good sign. Gorham Founders, that's stamped in. Then we've got Gorham Co. Founders, written in by the sculptor himself in the wax model. And it certainly looks very, very nice colour, condition. But have you ever noticed this little chap down here? I would need my glasses to see it. So you've never noticed it? I haven't, no, no. Right, let's go back up again. <laughs> the figure 82. Mm -hmm. He made 107 of this 21 and a half inch cast. So this is number 82. Mm -hmm. So that's quite exciting. So it's a genuine bronze. Excellent. Which is probably some relief to it you. It certainly is. It's Tell it's... me what um, this is. Well, this was a photograph that uh, my late father-in-law cut from the paper showing uh, a very similar bronze in the Oval Office uh, with President Clinton. Um, <laughs> he did actually write to Clinton uh, after seeing that. Um, sadly, he didn't get a reply. But he didn't write back? <laughs> he didn't write back. Too busy writing his memoirs, by the look of it, or something. <laughs> but that, well, it's not only is it similar bronze, it's the identical mm. cast. We can't tell from this photograph what size it is, but I think it's the same size. Mm. And one wonders whether it's Clinton's or whether it belongs in the Oval Office. Mm. Have you ever been to Boston, where Danham was born? I never have. Outside the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, which is a wonderful museum, is a full-size, probably even over-life-size, figure of this Indian chief. And it's a Sioux Indian. It's the chief of the Sioux Indians. They've been beaten, basically, by the settlers, if you like, and the Native American Indians have been beaten into submission, appealing to the great spirit. That's what he's doing. What do we do about this? Just appealing to his, to his spirits, to his gods, to find out what to do. I mean, it's a very emotive bronze. And I think in American history, it's a very important bronze. Um, so well known that this bronze figure, amazing as it may seem to us today, was as well known as a Statue of Liberty in its time. Really? It was that important. Well, I have to try and value it, really. Um, I think the only way I can do this is just <laughs> feel like this. <laughs> well, I do know that in 2005, in at auction in New York, Cast number 90 made $120,000. Wow. In today's money, it's £66,000. Right. And that's the same size as this, the same? The, the same, same size. Right. And it was cast number 90, you've got 82. Right. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> <laughs> you never know what's going to be brought along to the roadshow. And this little number caught my eye. It's an advertising display for beer from the 1950s. And it's in a Spice Girls video, no less. Now, this might not be the kind of thing you really, really want in your home, but the owner tells me it has pride of place in his sitting room, which must liven things up no end. And we've had a very lively day here at Bondard, too. Wonderful items in a spectacular setting. So from all the team here at the Roadshow in North Wales, bye-bye. Mm -hmm.